Welcome to today's membership luncheon, our congressional update featuring Congressman Dan Newhouse, which is sponsored by Battelle. I'm Lori Matson. I'm president and CEO of the Chamber, and I'd like to welcome you to today's luncheon. We're very pleased to host Congressman Dan Newhouse for what has become an annual August tradition. We look forward to hearing updates from Washington, D.C., as well as his perspective on key issues impacting central Washington and here at home in the Tri-Cities. Congressman Newhouse has been very busy traveling around the 4th District, which stretches from the Canadian border down to the Columbia River. Just last week, he hosted the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry, for a tour of the McNary Dam, the Pacific Northwest National Lab, the Hanford site, highlighting the importance of hydropower, energy research, and the ongoing cleanup efforts here in the Tri-Cities. Our format today is going to be slightly different than the past, as Congressman Newhouse has asked to spend the majority of his time taking questions. He's prepared some brief remarks, and then will accept questions either previously submitted or live from the audience, submitted electronically through our live polling site, Slido. So as a reminder, if you want to take out your mobile devices, uh, there's some instructions on your table, but if you open a, your browser and go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code TCRCC, you'll see a box where you can type in your question. So as we're all very aware, the political climate is very heated. Although Congressman Newhouse is happy to answer tough questions, I'd like to ensure a civil exchange. And I'd like to ask you to take that into consideration as you ask your questions today. If you don't have a question right now, but you think of one during the program, please feel free to type it in at any point during the program. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have. A special thanks to Cascade Natural Gas for sponsoring the live polling portion of our luncheon. So at this time, I'd like to recognize all of our elected officials who have joined us for today's luncheon and ask, as I read your name, if you would please stand and remain standing. Uh, our guest of honor, Congressman Dan Newhouse. Fra from Franklin County, we have Prosecuting Attorney Sean Sant. From Franklin County, we also have Commissioner Rick Miller and Commissioner Brad Peck. From the city of Kennewick, we have Councilman John Trumbo. From the city of Richland, we have Mayor Pro Tem Terry Christensen and Council Member Phil Lemley. From the Port of Benton, we have Commissioners Jane Haggerty, Roy Keck, and Bob Larson. From the Port of Kennewick, we have Commissioners Don Barnes and Skip Novakovich. From the Port of Pasco, we have Commissioner Jim Kleinworth. From Franklin PUD Commissioners, we have Stu Nelson and Roger Wright. If there's anyone I've forgotten, please stand so we can recognize you as well. And then if you would all help me in a round of applause thanking our elected officials for joining us today. Thank you so much. Don Barnes, how did we miss you? There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that, Don. You are unforgettable. Now, if you would all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Now I'd like to invite Elizabeth Holt, she's the Regional Chamber's Membership Development Director to the stage uh, to introduce the August Member of the Month as well as present membership plaques to the Chamber's newest members. Elizabeth. Thanks Lori. Uh, like she mentioned, each month the Regional Chamber's Awards and Recognition Committee selects a member business to, to recognize as Outstanding Member of the Month. This month, the Chamber is pleased to announce Ranch and Home as Member of the Month. Ranch and Home has been in the Tri-Cities community for nearly 35 years and a Regional Chamber member for nearly that long. Locally owned and operated by the Dress family, Ranch and Home is renowned in the area for their reliable products, outstanding customer service, and their generosity to the community. And I'm sure they're very busy this week. Please help me welcome Ranch and Home owner George Dress, and Greg and Morgan Hunsaker to accept this month's award. So I think we talked about you taking a photo with them. 
So while they're taking their photo, um, next, like again, Lori said, I'm excited to be able to announce some of the Chamber's newest members who are able to join us here at our luncheon today. If I call your name, please come forward, accept your membership plaque, and if you could stay, please stay after the luncheon for a group photo, uh, I, we would really appreciate it. So first of all, we have Terry Butts with Mid-Columbia Score. We have Jackie Z with Family Home Care. We have Melissa Nissen with TSP Bake Shop. And we have Justin Stordahl with Innovative Enterprise Systems. Please join me in welcoming these new members with a round of applause. And something new this month, we'd like to recognize some of the Chamber's longstanding members. So if you could please draw your attention to the screen. The members have been, that are listed have been involved with the Chamber for 20 years or longer. We appreciate their participation with the Regional Chamber and thank them for their a longstanding membership. Let's give these members a round of applause as well. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks to Ranch and Home, and welcome to all our new members. We appreciate your support, and we look forward to providing value to your business. At this time, I'd like to recognize today's presenting sponsor, Battelle, and to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Ashby, the director of the Pacific Northwest National Lab, to say a few words about PNNL, and to introduce Congressman Dan Newhouse. Please help me welcome Dr. Ashby. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation, the opportunity to be here. I am delighted to be here and on behalf of Battelle to have this opportunity to sponsor today's luncheon. And as you know, Battelle has been operating PNNL for over 50 years, which is really a legacy of commitment to this community that we're extremely proud of. I've been in this community now for nearly nine years, and I can attest to how welcoming this community is and how wonderful a place it is to live. And as we bring visitors here, they get to know what we're talking about and enjoy the Tri-Cities like we do. As one of the largest employers in Eastern Washington, Battelle has been a chamber member for the past 25 years, and we appreciate the chamber's efforts to advance the Tri-Cities businesses. And we've had a busy two weeks at the laboratory on the Hanford site. Uh, last week, we hosted Secretary of Energy Rick Perry at PNNL as well as in Hanford. And just yesterday, we had the pleasure of hosting the Deputy Secretary of Energy, Dan Bruyette. We were able to show the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary our work in addressing national priorities and delivering distinguishing outcomes in scientific discovery, energy resiliency, and national security. And I'm pleased to say that PNNL was the first laboratory that the Deputy Secretary had the opportunity to visit. When Secretary uh, Perry joined, uh, visited us, he was joined by Congressman Newhouse and Senator Cantwell, who are quite clearly proud of uh, the community and the assets we have here and showing off who we are in the Tri-Cities. And they also brought along Congressman Walden from Oregon. So we had quite the, uh, the group visiting the Tri-Cities. And Secretary Perry did note on the beautiful community in which we live and why he, was, uh, why he understood why we're also proud to be here, and why we care so much about the Tri-Cities. He also noted that we had a, quote, great set of advocates here in the Washington Congressional Delegation, and that we certainly do. And we're delighted for their strong support, including from today's uh, featured speaker, Congressman Dan Newhouse, who I'm now pleased to introduce. Congressman Newhouse is a lifelong resident of Washington State, and was raised in Sunnyside, where he still resides as a third generation farmer. From 2003 to 2009, he served as a member of the Washington State House of Representatives in Olympia. And in 2009, he was appointed director of the Washington State Department of Agriculture, connecting with farmers from across the state and promoting Washington's vast agricultural resources. In 2014, 
Congressman Newhouse was elected to serve Washington's 4th Congressional District. He currently serves on the Appropriations and Rules Committees, in addition to serving as Vice Chair of the House Nuclear Cleanup Caucus. Congressman Newhouse prepared a letter earlier this year introducing PNNL to the new administration, and he was able to get all 12 members of the Washington dele delegation to sign it, signaling strong bipartisan support for the work we do at the laboratory. Congressman Newhouse, thank you very much for that effort. As a new member of the House Appropriations Committee, the Congressman sought out and was selected to sit on the Energy and Water Development Subcommittee, a critical post that supports the Department of Energy funding at both the laboratory and at Hanford. In his first year on the subcommittee, he has already proved his mettle, supporting priorities for the laboratory and increased funding for Hanford. Congressman Newhouse, you've been truly a great partner and we appreciate all that you have done for the lab, Hanford, and the Tri-Cities, especially over the last several months. So in honor to have you with us today, Congressman, and now would you all please join me in a warm welcome for Congressman Dan Newhouse. So I've just decided I'm going to keep Steve with me at all times to give me int introductions. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be he here with you today. It really is. Um, I hope what you got out of that, that almost the most important thing, I'm a farmer. And um, that probably influences me a lot and what I do, how, how I uh, approach problems, uh, my work ethic, just a lot of different things that I think uh, growing up on a farm, uh, learning a lot of different kinds of responsibilities has really served me well. And you, you'll be happy to know, I think, th at least those of you that are beer drinkers in the room, that we just started picking hops yesterday. <clears throat> and so we should have a, a good supply. Oh, there's a few, right? <clears throat> so you can rejoice. We should have a good supply for you for the next year. Um, so let me, let me start off just on a personal note, if you don't mind. This is really the first time that um, uh, in a few months that I've been able to address this large of a crowd here at home. And I just wanted to say, um, you know, there's a, this has been a, an exciting year, a very uh, monumentous year in a lot of w ways. You know, we have a new administration in Washington, D.C., in our country. A, a lot of opportunities are presenting itself. But personally, this has been a difficult year for me. Many of you know I lost my wife just over three months ago. And I just wanted to express to everyone, because it's hard to personally touch so many people otherwise, my appreciation to you for uh, all the uh, cards and letters and emails and everybody that reached out in your own special way to me and my family. It's very much appreciative and appreciated and um, just thank you. Thank you for being, being um, giving me some space, giving me some time uh, to get, my, get used to my new reality, my new world. Um, and I, I thank, that ver thank you very much. It proves to me that I really do represent the best district in the country and, and that we have such great people here. So thank you very much. But um, get that. <clears throat> um, so. It truly is an honor to, to serve you. Let me start with that. Um, being a representative for the state of Washington, for central Washington, which is my home, um, it, it truly is something that I hold very uh, dear and the responsibility I have very deep. Uh, and it, it, it uh, is a, a huge thing and something it's an honor, but it's an also, also it's a tremendous uh, responsibility, and you all understand that. You, we've had we had great representation from Doc Hastings for two decades. Uh, huge shoes to to fill. Uh, he left a, a wide, a big mark in Washington D.C., and I'm doing my best to to get to that same level of uh, being able to influence things and decisions that are made, so that we can benefit from uh, having an experienced hand at the helm there as well. And like I said, we have a new administration. And with that, 
Everybody knew that, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, a new president, a new, a new uh, set of people throughout all federal agencies, uh, which offers actually a lot of opportunities, uh, different uh, perspectives, different, uh, different priorities on the, on the part of a lot of decision makers. But it also offers us, uh, um, brings us different obligations and different responsibilities. And it was a perfect, I think, uh, uh, our ability last week to have Secretary of Energy Rick Perry in town illustrates, I think, the need for us as a congressional delegation to educate those people that uh, don't know a lot about Central Washington and our issues, but are in positions of uh, authority and decision making, educate them as to what is important to us. So it was a huge opportunity uh, to have him here. I plan on having others uh, come to Central Washington as often and as soon as possible to do the same thing in other uh, areas, in other issue areas. Uh, so he came, uh, just talk about that a little bit, as Steve mentioned, he came to see uh, the laboratory, which uh, you guys got uh, a lot of time with him, which was good, and he utilized it very well. He came to see some of Hanford. You can't see Hanford in one afternoon, as he now knows. It's not just one building and uh, somewhere. It's a huge, uh, huge issue that he actually has done a lot of homework on, but I, I can speak for myself. There are so many things to understand about Hanford and the efforts going on there that we're going to need to get him back. Uh, we're going to need to continue educating him about what's going on at Hanford. Uh, and I, but I, the good news is, and I think he was able to uh, uh, vocalize this, that the responsibility of the federal government is real. The, the legal and moral responsibility that we have as a government to clean up the legacy left behind from winning World War II as well as the Cold War that uh, is, is our, in our backyard. Uh, that, that is something that is always, um, I won't say difficult, but it's always a challenge for us here in the state of Washington to tell that, continue to tell that story to others around the country. So let me put that in perspective. Hanford gets about 1% of the federal discretionary budget. And you can believe that that gets a lot of people's attention. And uh, questions are, why are we doing that? Why are we spending so much money out there in central Washington, the Pacific Northwest, which some people aren't sure it's part of the continental United States or not? Why do we continue to have to do that? Well, so that, that pre presents us with that continuing responsibility, that obligation, really, to make sure that people understand the necessity of that. You know, people come and go. Administrations change. The people in Congress uh, come and go. So we continually have to educate people. And so I'm very happy to do that. And I think we've been successful so far. But don't, don't for a minute think that it won't continue to be a challenge. It really will. And so having an energy secretary here to witness firsthand the great things that we're doing, the hard work that's going on, is essential. And then for him to come and spend so much time at the lab was, was great, too. I think he called the National Laboratories the crown jewel of the Department of Energy. And this was coming from an individual that wanted to get rid of the Department of Energy just a short time ago. You all re re remember that. I think now he understands really the critical and strategic uh, work that's being done by that federal agency in many, many different areas. And uh, the, the best example of that work is right there at the, at the National Laboratory that we are all so proud of. You know, it's a huge part of our economy, certainly, uh, with the, what is it, 4,500 employees, Steve shaking his head, um, but also a huge part of our country's future. The things that are being worked on, uh, the, uh, the, the research that's being uh, developed at, at the lab is truly amazing and will be part of, part of a successful future in so many different ways. And then the other thing, Congressman Greg Walden, from just across the, the river, represents Eastern Oregon, where the, the epicenter of the eclipse was. Did anybody go see that? You did. Really? Was the traffic really as bad as they were saying it was going to be? Six and a half hours. Wow, six and a half hours for a two-hour drive. I'm glad I stayed home. Um, 
but Greg re represents Eastern Oregon, and so we also showed Secretary Perry the, uh, the, the, the dam, the McNary Dam, that, so he could understand. You know, being from, from Texas, they think they know what water is, but when they see it on the, schedule, the scale that we have, uh, uh, they don't understand hydropower in Texas. And so it was a good thing, because it, it, many of you probably know that one of the um, uh, decisions or, or uh, goals of this administration was to sell uh, the assets that we have like Bonneville Power. Uh, and we were able to, in Congress, beat that back, fight that, and the Budget Committee opted not to include that in our proposal going forward. So I think it was especially important to have the Energy Secretary see firsthand just exactly what these dams are all about and what, the, uh, what they have done for our region and the critical nature of keeping them uh, in, a, in a way that they can be, uh, continue to provide uh, the energy that we need in a, in a, in a very efficient way. So, uh, so that was a big week last week to have the, the secretary here, and certainly glad that we were able to do that. Let me talk about some of the other things that have been uh, taking some of my uh, uh, attention and effort over the last, well, I guess I could say since the last time I visited with you, which is in a group like this has been a year ago. So there's been a ton of stuff, and I won't go over everything, but, and maybe in some of the questions we can, we can touch on things. Do you remember, um, I guess it's two years ago plus the port slowdown on the west coast. Certainly a lot of people should. Cost our economy about uh, three quarters of a billion dollars just right here in the state according to our uh, some of the organizations that measure that. With they, the the uh, longshoremen and the uh, association that manages those ports had come to an agreement finally, but that contract agreement was up for um, uh, renegotiation. We got some great news just recently that they have agreed to a three-year extension of that renegotiated contract. So that will give us more certainty, at least into the the, the, the near future, that our ports will continue to be competitive, they'll continue to be, provide the certainty that our suppliers, our exporters, and our importers need. Uh, you know, it's a competitive world out there, if you guys understand that. Um, the, 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 the ports in the state of Washington, and up and down the west coast, are competing with Canada, or competing with Mexico, and now with the widening of the, of the, um, the Panama Canal, we're you know, it's just as easy for some of these ships to just go around to the East Coast. And you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that East Coast ports are um, watering at the mouth with the prospects of, of being the, the final destination instead of having to receive things by rail. And so we have to make sure that we do everything that we can to be as competitive in this competitive world as we possibly can. So I'll continue to work on that. I can continue to make sure that our supply chains remain intact. I know, I know farmers that have had lost tremendous amounts of money personally because they couldn't get their product shipped. Uh, a lot of those markets are just now recovering uh, from that disruption that they had, and so it's tremendously important. And, uh, and uh, Dave Reichert and I, I should give him some credit as well, uh, worked on some legislation that we hope will keep transparency at the ports and allow them to continue uh, working as well as they should. Um, many of you have heard that the, uh, through the Congressional Review Act, we have uh, been able to turn back a lot of regulations from previous administrations that we felt were inhibiting the ability of our economy to grow, so we wanted to highlight that. One of the things, I was just asked by a reporter, what, what am I going to be doing when I get back to Washington, D.C.? One of those things has, is the issue of tax reform. Uh, the tax code that we have in this country is not as conducive as it, I'm trying to be politically correct here, but I don't know why I need to be. It's not as conducive to a strong, vibrant economy as it could be. 
uh, we're looking at ways that we can keep more money in people's pockets so that they can invest in their businesses, hire more people, pay higher wages, and, and make our economy grow, which will in turn increase tax revenue to the government as well. You know, there, there's, you know, there's added benefit. One of the things that's interesting that I learned about, a lot of businesses, you know, we're not the only nation that they do business in, obviously. And a lot of the profits they make in other countries stay in other countries because if they try to bring them back to the United States, we tax them at a higher rate than if they would just keep them wherever they're situated. So we're looking at how we can rebalance that equation to make sure that we are as competitive as, competitive as we possibly can be to encourage some of that money back into our country to in invest in our economy. And I think, you know, at, the last major tax reform effort, I think, was in the 1980s under President Reagan. Since that time, many countries have kind of jumped over us and uh, have, have left us behind in that competitive uh, tax situation. So we need to look at ways that we can improve that and, and return us to being a leader in, the, in, this, uh, in this world economy. It's, an, it's critical for whether it's uh, uh, large companies or, or even small businesses in smaller communities around the country. Um, now this may be a, a surprise to some, but there's been a lot of stuff coming in, out in the news, a lot of distractions from D.C. Uh, that take away, I think, uh, from what we're actually accomplishing, uh, unfortunately. Um, but we don't have control over the news media. So I'm going to try to tell you just a couple things that we actually have been doing. Um, maybe some of you knew this, but maybe, and, and a good credit for you if you do, that means you're probably a, a C-SPAN junkie or, or really, really pay close attention to some of these issues. But we passed an overhaul of the way that, of the way that the Veterans Administration works so that veterans can better get the care that they deserve and that the treat and the treatment they need which is a significant uh, move forward we we uh, made a huge payment on the uh, rebuild up of our military uh, which we had fallen behind over the you know some of the stories i have heard uh, gosh i can't remember the number a huge number of our planes can't even fly because they don't have the spare parts available to them. And they're having to, you know, just like we would, I would do on my farm. If something gets parked for more than a week, be careful because somebody's going to rob something off of it to put on something else they want to keep running. And that's what we're doing in our military. So the preparedness that we need, especially in this ever-changing, more dangerous world, just isn't where it should be. And so, so that's some of the things that we're addressing in rebuilding our military. We provided more resources to fight the opioid epidemic that is a scourge across this country. And don't, don't kid yourself that it isn't a problem here in central Washington. It, we may not be the, 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 the hills of Appalachia where it's a tremendously, uh, gosh, it's just terrible some of the things that it's doing the communities around some of the middle part of the country. But we have the issue here as well, and we're trying to address that as much as we can. We have a plan in place to reduce some of the regulatory reform in, the fi in our financial institutions around the country that was a result of the recession in 2008 that uh, we, we feel has gone too far in restricting the way community banks, smaller banks, credit unions are able to operate. I've heard so many stories from folks in those institutions that their uh, ability to do business is really hampered. And have you see, probably seen some of the um, consolidation I guess you could call it, or closing of, of many of the smaller financial institutions that just cannot handle the regulatory workload. It's just too much for them. And so they're either having to close or be gobbled up by someone larger. Um, just, just recently, the president signed, uh, I think it was the, the biggest expansion of, of the GI Bill in a decade allowing uh, or removing time limits for veterans to use their benefits, which doesn't sound like much, but in, in this day and age, uh, a, a uh, continuing education is necessary for people to be, remain a viable part of, of the workforce. And then we just recently passed some really tough restrictions on some of the bad players in this world, you know, thinking Iran and North Korea and Russia. 
uh, to try to deal with some of the, in a, in a economic way versus a military way, some of the threats that we face around the country, uh, so, which is a huge issue in the news right now. So that's, that's some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, I remember my first report to you, I, I was going. I came in as a you know brand new member of Congress. Was going was armed with all kinds of things that I was going to tell you, and it looked to me watching people around the room that after a few minutes I could see some disinterested faces, and I so I didn't want to overwhelm you with too many things, and nobody wants to listen to a laundry list that's a mile long, but just just know that there are a ton of things we're working on. Contrary to what you may believe after listening to the, the, the press, uh, we're working very hard. I can, am working very hard on your behalf and will continue to do that, whether it's making sure we have adequate funding for what's going on at the, the cleanup site out at Hanford, we'll make sure that the lab has the, the resources avail available to it, and making sure that, that, that downtown communities, small businesses uh, can continue to be as competitive and successful as they possibly can be, which I think is something I hope that the members of the Tri-City Regional Chamber are interested in. But th there's a lot of things that I have not mentioned, a lot of things that are important. Doesn't mean that I didn't, because I didn't mention them, they're not. Certainly there are, but there's just not enough time in the day and I wanted to make sure that we had time for some questions. But let me just say, uh, I repeat that it is truly an honor to represent all of you in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's, it's a responsibility that I take very seriously. Uh, I work as hard as I can on your behalf, and I want to continue to do that. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to come meet in front of you and let you uh, ask questions of me if you so desire and, and, and bring you up to date a little bit on what we've been doing. And, and, and I really do, you know, there, I see, looking through the room, I see so many people that I see on a fairly regularly, regular basis. Some almost, too, well, I won't say too much, but it, <laughs> uh, no, not thinking of anyone in particular, but, um, and I appreciate that. I, you know, this, this, this representative business, it's just that I represent you. If that's a scary thought, tell me. But I represent you. I'm your voice in Washington. And I can be so much more effective if I know what you're thinking. And so please, don't be shy. Don't be bashful about letting me know what you think. We may not always agree. I can guarantee you that. We won't always agree. But it really helps me understand if I know what you're thinking. And, and you know, I'm not, um, I'm not adverse to, if, if you've got a be better argument than what I'm basing my opinion on, you know, I'm, I'm an open-minded kind of guy. And so I really appreciate that communication. It helps me do my job better. So, so with that, um, I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to be here, watch you eat lunch while I can't. Uh, but uh, I guess at that point, shall we, shall we go to questions? And I had some instructions. Am I just supposed to start here? No? Oh. <laughs> Next, <laughs> a softball question. To get. So I didn't even admit to that, and you're, you're outing me here, Lori. <laughs> I won't sign that. This is an anonymous question, but, <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is the largest fish you caught in Alaska? Uh, maybe you didn't know that, but I did take part of the five-week recess. And can I tell, the, tell you why, if you don't mind? This was a kind of a funny story in a way. Last summer, uh, we had a fundraising event up, up the valley a little ways, and one of the one of the, uh, there was an auction to help raise money. And uh, one of those was a fishing trip to Alaska. And somebody kept bidding on this. Somebody really wanted this trip. Uh, and I finally looked around to see who it was, and it was my wife. Uh, I went up to her and I said, Carol, this, we're tr they're trying to raise money for us, not, well, she says, no, I want, I, it's always something I wanted to do. So it was on her bucket list. Well, she was not able to go, unfortunately, but my son and I took the trip a couple weeks ago, and so we were able to fulfill her, her desire to do that. And I guess the answer is, I think it was about 10 pounds, a silver salmon, about 10 pounds. So, but thank you. Next question. <laughs> um, are we done fighting to keep our dams in place? <clears throat> that 
Uh, I don't know how much time you want me to take answering these questions, but the answer is absolutely not. I, I think I've related to some of you a uh, time or two. The very first appointment that I had when I was uh, uh, first got to Washington, D.C. was from a gentleman who was uh, adamant and had provided charts and graphs and numbers and figures on why we should breach the Snake River dams. Uh, so the, so that told me that the effort is alive and well. You, you probably, some of you participated in some of the um, uh, efforts in the last year to bring to attention the need to keep uh, these dams on the Columbia and the Snake uh, in place. Uh, uh, they, so the answer is no. Uh, we also have a federal judge. We seem to have every federal judge that gets these cases wants to uh, consider breaching the dams as part of the uh, biological opinion. Um, so we had continue to have to make the case that, uh, that having the dams on, the, on our, our river system provide us much more benefits than detriments. They become a huge part of our economy, not, not just in power generation, although that is big, but in transportation, in recreation, just coming from fishing in Alaska, I can tell you that's important too. Uh, but also, don't forget flood control. Well, they were a huge part of making sure that our communities didn't live under the threat of being inundated with uh, a wall of water. Uh, no one remembers Vanport, Oregon, or was, was it Oregon or Washington? Vanport, Oregon, I think. But that was, you know, 1948, uh, virtually eliminated. So, so there, I, I, the, the answer is no. We still have to continue to make the case. Is there another question? Ah. Please come, you, 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 so you, you guys, can you see these questions? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, I wanted to make sure, because you probably would think I'm just reading what I want to read here, but. <laughs> <clears throat> Please comment on continuing resolution and ability for government to establish budget in FY18 that supports the vital cleanup at, at Hanford. So I think, I, I hope I've addressed that somewhat. It's a continuing effort, it really is, to make sure that people understand that the federal government, we're not going to let them off the hook. They have, they, us, all of us as a nation, has to be responsible, held accountable to the legal and moral obligation that, that we have at, at, at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Uh, but like I said, with a number that big, it gets a lot of attention. And I guess that's okay. It really is. You know, we're not trying to sneak something in in the dark of night. I am totally fine with justifying on a regular basis the need to do this. It, it, it's, it's, you know, these are questions that should be asked of any big budget, of any number really, but any huge budget number. So I'm okay with that. I think that that's a, a, just a part of the process. It's good. We should always be under scrutiny. We should always be looking for ways to be as efficient as we possibly can, right? And get it done as quickly as we possibly can. I think the contractors would agree to that. The, the, the folks working at the site would agree to that. No one wants this to, to go on uh, indefinitely. Uh, we want life after Hanford cleanup. Everybody wants that. Uh, and we know that the dollars are finite. You know, we cannot, uh, can't guarantee that these huge uh, amounts of dollars will continue to come. And I want to applaud some of the groups here in, in the Tri-Cities, the Tri-City Cha Regional Chamber is one, uh, of looking ahead. You know, what does what the Tri-Cities look like post cleanup? And I think that that's a, a reality that we're already beginning to see what it might look like. And I'm very excited about that future. But. Okay. So you guys, I didn't know you guys could read these. So I don't know if I have to read them to you. But local efforts have been trying to get the federal government to give back the shoreline to our local communities. Is that still in the works? Uh, it absolutely is uh, still in the works. In fact, I've been... Uh, almost on a weekly basis, either I or my staff meet with some of the local folks here that are very engaged in that. Uh, we, we passed some legislation last year to uh, bring the Army Corps of Engineers into the process so that they would could tell us how, excuse me, the disposition of all those parcels of land, and there's a ton of them. Uh, how many are there, David? There's, I don't know, 3,000 or something like that. There's a lot. And, and um, but the key thing to remember here 
<clears throat> and this is where I need your help. You know, this is not an effort coming from the federal government. How, how often do you know of that the federal government looks at communities and say, hey, would you like some of this land we have? Um, you know, this is, this is an effort from, from folks in the community here who see an opportunity, uh, see a need that could be resolved. And so, so you, we are coming to the federal government and saying, we want this. At least that's what I need to know for sure that that's the case. And I think I, think I can say that with confidence. Uh, but I want, I want everyone in the room to know and in the community that this has to be a, truly a grassroots effort. And um, it, we are still working as hard as we can to make sure this becomes reality. If that's what the community wants, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, we're looking at legislation to forward that, uh, but it's uh, it's not. I've found you know this is probably something that shouldn't be news, but certainly have fa found this to be true. There is nothing simple about dealing with the federal government. There's nothing, and and this is a great example of how difficult something seemingly easy uh, to accomplish uh, can be. But yeah, you know, we're, we're moving forward, and I think wasn't it. Wasn't it last year, the, the, didn't you have a question that people could text in? We had an overwhelming response of 90 plus percent, right, Lori? Wasn't it something like that, that people supported that? And I think that that probably, if you did that again today, it would be very similar, wouldn't it? I'm guessing. Yeah. Any more questions? Will immigration reform move forward prior to midterm elections? Um, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, you should know this about me, I'm a pretty optimistic half gla or glass half full kind of person. <clears throat> I think that we have a, a, a great opportunity to move immigration reform. A and I, I would make the prediction that many people may find hard to believe that Donald Trump will be the president to sign immigration reform legislation. Uh, I, I, some of the things that he's, well, he said things on both sides of this, but some of the things that I, I've heard him say make me think that he is open to uh, solving the immigration I issue that we have in this country. Um, but this is a, com as you know, this is one of the most complicated issues that we have in D.C. It's, it's not easy. There's a lot of people that want to increase border and interior security. Um, and I guess on, I don't know what the other extreme would be. I, I don't know of anybody that wants to just, you know, open the doors and let everyone in. But uh, there's certainly people that want to relax some of the requirements that we have in place. But uh, there's more people in the center that want to solve the issue. Um, we have certainly a, a several segments of our economy that depend on foreign workers migrant workers, and unfortunately a lot of those are illegal workers, which as far as, you know, you, you guys are all business people. Think about that. Your, your business plan relies on a illegal source of labor. Wow. That's a pretty tenuous position to be in. Uh, plus the impact that that has on our communities to have these, these people amongst us who are illegal. It's not fair to us, it's not fair to them. Uh, this is truly one of the big uh, issues of our day. Uh, but the fact that the president wants increased security, a lot of other people do. There are other people that, and I won't take the president out of this, that want to find a solution for our immigration issue. The balance of that, as you know, uh, especially in the Senate, they can't pass anything unless it's bipartisan, and that's, unless there's a give and take, unless there's a balanced solution. So if we're going to get that increased border security, we're going to have to be able to look at uh, uh, accepting some of the, uh, uh, the solutions for immigration. So I'm, I'm optimistic that this can happen before 2018 elections. Randy asks, there's been a lot of discussion on the need for major federal infrastructure funding to support our nation's economy. What sort of programs will be enacted? So that's a tough one because there's, there truly is not a lot of meat on the bones on the infrastructure issue yet. Uh, I think, was it just last week, the president came out um, with a, an infrastructure press conference that I didn't see it because I was in Alaska, but 
that kind of devolved into something less than that. Uh, maybe some of you saw that. Um, you know, we have been, as a Congress, you know, there's been a lot of other things taking our attention up till now. So I, I guess I'd have to say I, I don't know specifics on what an infrastructure effort will look like. Uh, and there's been a little talked about, maybe things along the line of public and private partnerships, investments. Uh, so um, what that looks like, I, I can't say for certain. Uh, but I, I do know that this is still a priority of the administration, of the president, and, and of Congress as well. We share this priority, but, uh, but unfortunately at this point I just don't have a lot of specifics to give you. Sorry, Randy. Cat. Cat. I like that name. Business ownership often means becoming a public figure. As a public figure yourself, how do you handle the criticism, comment, slash commentary that comes from the spotlight. Wow. <clears throat> you're assuming I get criticized a lot. Is that what you're <laughs> trying to say? Um, well, what was it that Abraham Lincoln said? You can't please all the people all the time and all of that. And, and I can assure you that that is the case. Uh, uh, particularly this year, there's, we seem to have an increase in the number of people that are engaged in the political process. And I think overall that's a good thing. Uh, but we also have what Lincoln didn't have. We have social media and all kinds of other avenues for people to express their opinions. And s sometimes it's not always in the most positive way. You know, you have to, I guess, it's not always easy to accept criticism, but I, 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 you have to have a thick skin, right? You have to be able to understand that maybe some people's opinions may not be formed by knowing everything about the issue that caused you to make a decision and so you have to give them that. Uh, so uh, I, I don't, I, I try not to take any criticism per personally. Uh, if, if you disagree, you know, my wife and I used to disagree on a lot of things uh, and we never, I shouldn't say we never took it personally, I guess that's a, but that's a whole other subject. But you know, it, it's, it's more of a um, you know, a professional kind of a disagreement that in, in politics it should be anyway and not a personal one. And so I, tr I try to keep it on that level. Uh, the best thing I found to do <clears throat> is just be as open and upfront with people as possible. No surprises, right? You should never read in the paper something about me and think, well, well that doesn't make any sense. He said something else, you know, two weeks ago or a month ago. Uh, I try to be as consistent as I possibly can. Um, so that the so that there's not confusion about where I stand on something. Now, I suppose having said that, you have to always you know, you know I'm always learning. I'm always trying to uh, know as much as I can about any particular subject, and so that doesn't that that, that should not paint you into a corner of never ha being able to alter or change your mind about something, right? Try not to do that much because that, that causes confusion. But you have to be able to uh, make decisions based on the information you have. And if you get new information that changes something, you know, that, that's, that's the sign of, I think, of someone that can be responsible and responsive and not just flip-flopping, but being able to, and you, but then you have to go out and explain it as well. So there's that too. But, but it's, uh, as business people, I, um, uh, I'm sure that you face some similar things, but just, just remember that your customers are always right. And as long as you're honest with them, treat them fairly, that that's, that's uh, as much as you can do and, and you should expect that kind of treatment back. More. Domestic terrorism combined with foreign threats, Russia and North Korea have made Americans incredibly fearful of our safety. What are you doing to keep us safe? Um, you're absolutely right, Anonymous. This is a, I hear this from more people than you would ever imagine, uh, especially when we have um, North Korea threatening uh, you know, we, we live in a, I'm not sure that we're strategically placed necessarily, but we're certainly within range of a missile coming from North Korea, right? Uh, hopefully Seattle's a little bit more uh, attractive. <laughs> but no. that's, I'm sorry about that. But 
<clears throat> but it, you know, it is cause for concern that the mainland of the United States is within range of a crazy dictator in North Korea that has has made clear that his intentions are to to do that. Uh, so, you know, as a part of a, and I'm not on the particular committees to tell you everything that, that is happening, but I do know that uh, we're using every means available. Uh, other than militarily, to try to uh, stem these threats, whether they come from Iran, whether they come from Afghanistan, whether they come from um, North Korea or Russia. Um, you know, the, there's been news just recently of the president uh, asking for a, a buildup of troop presence in Afghanistan, responding to the uh, um, advice of his military advisors. Uh, one of those is our, our own neighbor, James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and you probably remember uh, Donald Trump, candidate Donald Trump, was one of the biggest skeptics of our presence in Afghanistan. And, um, but here, just what I just said before, with information that he has now, I'm sure this probably was a very difficult decision for him to make. He has changed. He has decided that the safety of the homeland, of, the, of America's security, is at stake here and that we have a, an increased role in Afghanistan. Uh, hopefully we won't get, you know, um, to that point in, with these other countries. Hopefully the economic actions, the dipl diplomatic actions or steps that are being taken um, are successful. They, they need to be, uh, certainly when you have nuclear weapons on the table. Uh, it's just a, you know, that's a whole game changer. And so we're engaging with, you know, as many people as we can to make sure that we don't get to that point. Can you comment on the government's position on supporting commercial nuclear power and <clears throat> how that position will impact Tri-Cities? <clears throat> um, well, I think, I think the federal government is quite supportive. In fact, the ESA small modular reactors are part of the uh, strategy moving forward from the federal government. Hopefully, we'll be get at some point, you get some of the construction of those here in the Tri-Cities. Um, but certainly, uh, companies here will have a role in that, wh whether they're built here or not, uh, moving forward. So I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm bullish on uh, nuclear uh, energy production in this country. Um, I'm also, uh, you know, we, things change in Congress, and as you know, uh, this last election changed the complexion of the United States Senate. Efforts are underway now to re-engage uh, re Yucca Mountain as part of our uh, uh, repository for spent nuclear fuel, uh, or nuclear waste, um, and fuel. Um, and so I'm, I, uh, I, I'm optimistic that our future, our nuclear future is bright. Uh, it's a you know carbon free um, source of of energy. Uh, if we can solve the the waste issue, uh, I think that that's just a, uh, uh, a tremendously bright future for for nuclear energy. Good. I'm not seeing one come up on the screen yet. That must be a good sign, right? Yes. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it being with you and. Um, I uh, look forward to seeing you, seeing you again. But thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Newhouse. It's always great to see you, and uh, you draw a great crowd to our luncheon, and we appreciate hearing all of the things you're busy doing for us. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Anna Solik from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, she has a presentation to make for uh, Representative Newhouse. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Solik. I'm the manager of the Northwest Regional Office for the United States Chamber of Commerce, where our, our office is located in Seattle. We cover six different states uh, in the Northwest. I know, sorry. <laughs> I heard, I picked up on the comment. 
I think I must be the only Seattleite here. The Chamber is the world's largest business association representing the interests of more than 3 million businesses and 1,500 state and local chambers of commerce. Our partnership with local chambers of commerce like the Tri-Cities Chamber is what allows our organization to be a strong voice for business in Washington, D.C. We value your input and rely on it to guide the chamber so that we can work better for a business. So thank you to the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce. Each year, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is honored to recognize members of Congress who demonstrate the strongest support for the business community with our annual Spirit of Enterprise Award. Last year, the Chamber highlighted 14 House votes that were most significant to, bi to business and scored Congress based on these votes. Among them were votes to overturn the unprecedented Waters of the United States Rule, or WOTUS, to, to defend intellectual property rights, and to relieve small businesses of regulatory burdens. I'm proud to be here today to present the Spirit of Enterprise Award to Congressman Dan Newhouse. Not only has he demonstrated his str strong support for the business community throughout Washington State, but he has achieved a 100% voting with business 14 out of 14 times. And for that, I'd also like to recognize the Congressman with our Business Builder and Job Creator Award, new this year and reserved only for members who have received a perfect score. Each year the Congressman receives a perfect score, he'll get a sticker to add to his hard hat trophy, which I'll present him with in a moment. Congratulations to you, Representative Newhouse. Thank you for demonstrating that you know what Washington businesses need to succeed. Thank you to the Tri-Cities Chamber for allowing me to be here today. And again, on behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and our state and local chambers throughout Washington State, thank you, Congressman, and congratulations. your trophy. Sorry about that Seattle <laughs> track. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And your hard hat. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Do you want a photo op? Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've got um, We'll have Austin. Okay. Hey, Austin, can we get you up here for a little photo op while we're closing out the show here? If you guys just stand just stand off there, Austin will come up and take care of this. So uh, thank you so much, Anna, for being here. And congratulations. And again, thank you, uh, Representative Newhouse, for all your great representation. Thanks to all of you for participating today and uh, working with our live questions and for Cascade Natural Gas for sponsoring this. Uh, we look forward to having more questions for you next month. Uh, obviously, with all of the issues that have been addressed today, it's a great reminder that as a business community, we have a unique role. We're the innovators, the employers, the job creators, the leaders that help our economy grow and to move our country forward. It's very important for all of us to stay engaged, contribute to a civil discussion on the issues, and advocate for a prosperous future.